Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a Triad production. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Taylor. Up to a third of typically developing children will experience some sleep disturbance, with most children experiencing difficulties going to sleep or maintaining sleep during the night, sometimes both. However, when we think of children with autism spectrum disorder, I'll be referring to that throughout the show as ASD. We don't often realize that as many as 80% of these children experience debilitating sleep disturbance, with trouble falling asleep and the tendency to wake up throughout the night being the most commonly reported complaints. My guest today is Emily Verone. Emily is a board certified behavior analyst with dedicated sleep focus on sleep related behaviors. She has over 22 years of experience and since 2010, she's devoted her practice to improving the sleep habits of children diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Emily's company, Ready, Set, Sleep, provides education, CEUs, sleep program development and individual consultation to families seeking support with their children's sleep. Combining the science of behavioral analysis with science of sleep, Emily also creates a learning opportunity for BCBAs to enhance their practice by providing context for the way sleep and behavior can both complement and at times sabotage one another. Emily, I want to welcome you to our show. So nice to have you here today. So nice to be here. That was such a nice welcome. <laughs> oh, great. Well, I'm glad. It's all, it's all true. And it's going to be nice to have you in our show today, more learn more about what you're doing in specialty. You know, I introduced in the beginning that you've been in the field for 22 years, Mm -hmm. but in 2010, you decided to devote a good portion of your attention to improving the sleep habits of children diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. What led to this focus being added to your practice? My first child was born in 2008. My second was born in 2010. And I had just educated myself on sleep. It was the one thing as a new parent that I I just never wanted to suffer through. We moved from Los Angeles down to Orange County in 2010. And the very first day I went out on my first overlap with my new clinical manager, all three of the clients that we saw that day all happened to have sleep problems. And You know, the things that I I knew about at the time sort of fell in the do no harm category, right? Right. Things like lighting, things like timing of bedtimes, things just environment, routines, naps versus no naps, things like that. And so I very gently said, hey, I I think I can help this client. Now, it's just on my first overlap. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right out of the gate. You know, I mean, I had been in the field already 10 years, but this was my first overlap with my new company. And Dr. Andy Nicholson Brennan, who is like my my mentor, she said, yeah, go ahead. And all three clients had three different sort of problems. And she came back to me about two weeks later and said, oh my gosh, Emily, they're all sleeping. You're our sleep guru now. Wow, <laughs> and then awesome. so that's just kind of how it started. I went and I got some CEUs through Dr. Gregory Hanley, who was the sleep guy at the time, even though uh-huh. now he's the practical functional assessment guy, but he was the sleep guy at the time. So I saw him quite a few times, read his research, just educated myself and started providing in-house trainings at the company at the time. And I was the designated sleep consultant for the company at the time. And that just sort of grew to company-wide. They had 15, then sort of 20 offices and then grew and grew and grew. And I was traveling and and just spreading sleep in the autism community. Yeah. And and that's what happened in 2010. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's fantastic. What a great way to kind of almost kind of just kind of fall into this and kind of just notice, let yeah. me try it. And you're successful here. Yeah. You know, we've all been taught that, you know, sleep is so essential. In fact, I think there's more and more focus now coming back into our lives and our awareness. In fact, I'm just reading Tony Robbins book, Life Force, and he has mm. a really significant section talking about the importance of sleep. We, we kind of all know it, but we don't oftentimes kind of partake in it in the way that we should, you know, the benefits of sleep and also the consequence mm-hmm. of a lack thereof. But yes. as we focus on children with ASD, sleep is a very real challenge for them and for their parents. And these consequences secondary to sleep can be quite significant. Let's start by helping our listeners understand from your understanding, why are children with ASD more prone to sleep to problems and some sleep challenges that they go through? So... 
there's a lot of research now coming out. I'll hit on all of the different research studies that are sort of newer. And then I'll also touch on the things that we sort of observe in the field. One thing that they see now is that some children on the autism spectrum metabolize their melatonin differently. So yeah. if we look at a, a, a typically developing brain, we see a spike in melatonin at night, right? And it kind of signals all the other sleep hormones, right? It's not the only sleep hormone, but it's an important one. And then we metabolize it overnight so that after kind of four or five hours of sleep, we're not producing it anymore. So it has a function of like beginning of the night, signal sleep, and then we metabolize it, it wears off, and then wash, rinse, repeat the next night, and we don't produce any melatonin during the day. What they did find in one study was that some children diagnosed with autism don't metabolize it as fast. So they have kind of low levels of melatonin throughout the day, which can cause some differences in, in sleep drive, right? So the sleep drive at night might not be so high. And the tendency to nap longer into childhood and be more sleepy during the day is sometimes seen as well. So that's kind of one thing. Another research study, and, and this is kind of more common now, is that we're just seeing this bi-directional relationship where it's like chicken and the egg. Does the poor sleep cause more challenges with autism symptoms or are the autism symptoms contributing to poor sleep? And there, there is no chicken and there is no egg. It really is just bi-directional where when we get poor sleep, we have worse behavioral symptoms, right? We have worse symptoms, lower language production and development. So we end up with language problems, behavior problems, and other things that kind of compound that autism mm -hmm. diagnosis, those things that naturally come along. Stereotypy, we see a lot of stereotypy, obviously, in the autism population. Lack of sleep increases stereotypy. So does the increased stereotypy cause poor sleep or is poor sleep contributing to the increased stereotypy? It's really hard to determine until the child is getting better sleep, Got after it. which we always see a decrease in something like stereotypy. Define that for a stereotypy. Yes. So yeah. stereotypy is self-stimulation. So that might be hand right. flapping. That might be fixation on certain parts of items or certain topics. It can also be finger picking, things like that. I mean, we all sort of have our own forms of stereotypy, right. leg shaking, things like that. But it's sort of these repetitive self-stimulatory behaviors that we often see with self-regulation for children in the autistic population. That's really helpful to understand that piece because that's, that, that's the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems not mm -hmm. kind of being able to function. Right. You know, in healthy ways right. and that parasympathetic nervous system. I always think of, you know, parasympathetic, para, paramedic that helps <laughs> us kind of calm down or makes things better. Yes. But with that high cortisol, low melatonin, it's, it's yes. hard to regulate, isn't it? And that can Correct. cause some of those chronic sleep challenges that they're having. Correct. Correct. So, you know, we do see when we are able to achieve better sleep in the autism population, we see improvements in behavior, improvements yeah. in language acquisition improvements in skill acquisition, you know, decrease in maladaptive behaviors, all of that. So a decrease in that stereotypy, that self-stimulatory right. or self-regulatory behavior, just improvements all around. And we see this in, in the adult population as well, right? We think more clearly when we're better slept, yeah. right? We don't well, make as many mistakes. We can retain information better if we're well slept. So right. it's, a, it's a function of the brain, right? I'd like to dive down just a little bit into that. I, I want to talk about what improvements we're going to naturally be seeing. But let's talk about what are the consequences uniquely that we might see in, in terms of when there's a lack of sleep with a child on the autism spectrum disorder, what are some of the consequences that are unique to them? I, I know one of the things is that they tend to find that for them, they spend less time in rapid eye movement stage of sleep, but this can have some real consequences in their lives. Some of the repetitive behavior you're talking about, mm. what are the consequences are you seeing behaviorally, interpersonally, that go on and maybe even some of the impact to the caregivers. Yeah. So in any poorly slept brain, we see an increase in anxiety and depression Yeah. when we're poorly slept. So that's just exacerbated in a, you know, in a younger child that, you know, isn't able to necessarily verbalize how they're feeling or what's, you know, their internal right. experience is, let's say, you know, I mean, the, the effects are, are not much different in the autism population than in the typical population, but okay. it's magnified because behaviors are often magnified. Right? right. So we, you know, in the, let's say in the non-autism population, 
we might not see a seven-year-old with severe aggression, but we would see, you know, in the autism population, a child with severe aggression. And so what we see in the underslept brain is an increase in intensity, frequency, duration of some of these maladaptive behaviors, like aggression, inability to control themselves, things like that. Now, let's say we'll take a non-autistic brain. They might be grumpy, grouchy, talking back, things like that, right? right? It's not necessarily going to show up as aggression if aggression wasn't in that consumer's behavioral profile. But if we already have a client who's prone to aggression as a means of communication or as a means of you know, escaping a, a, a non-desired activity or yes. a means of getting a basic need met, we are going to see an increase in all of the dimensions of that behavior, right? Got it. Because of that lack of coping, the increase in impulsivity. So in the poorly slept brain, we see increases in impulsivity in general, in everyone. But if we already have an impulsive brain, yeah. it's just going to be worse. So I, I don't know if that 100% answers the question, but I guess yeah, the, the answer with how it impacts the family is it just makes everything so much more magnified, right? So in, a, in an average poorly slept family, you know, people are irritable, you know, coping mechanisms go away. You know, you'll see mom is really irritable because mom is usually the one, unfortunately, who bears the brunt of the child's poor sleep, right? Right. And most people don't come to me necessarily because their child isn't sleeping. They're coming to me because they're not sleeping. Yes. And if the top of the food chain is poorly slept, right? If parents aren't slept, they're not going to be able to endure all of the stuff that the poorly slept child is now dishing up. So it really becomes a systems problem where if nobody is sleeping, no one is thriving. And it's really hard for parents. Let's talk about the ABA world, like the applied behavior analytical world, where we are providing direct services to the families. Now we see parents who are sleeping through their parent Mm -hmm. training sessions or their caregiver Mm -hmm. support sessions or they're using their ABA sessions, their therapy sessions as a time for their own break, rather than as an opportunity to learn from the providers, right? Yeah. It becomes you know, less motivating for families or caregivers to participate in those things because they're so exhausted. Got it. So they're in self-preservation mode, right? They're in their own fight or flight experience and their child is in their own fight or flight experience as well so it, the bet. whole system is just it's a hard state to be in isn't it it is such a, a taxing state it really yeah. is it's draining and and Very, it's hard when your child already you know doesn't have a pre-existing yes. behavioral profile mm-hmm. you know that that's concerning and it's just even you know it's just more exacerbated and magnified in the autism population you know besides the parental self report when people are coming in and saying hey you know we're not sleeping here and What are some additional ways that you might analyze or evaluate sleep disturbance in children with ASD? Anything unique or specific to them? Yes. I call them my poor sleep red flags. All right. What are those? (laughs) Poor sleep red flags. So the way we can sort of analyze that in the behavior world is sessions canceled, right? That's the first thing. A session is being canceled because the child is still asleep or the child falls asleep during session or you know, it's it's two or three o'clock and a parent cancels because the child has fallen asleep in the car. So sleeping during sessions or canceling sessions due to the child being asleep or falling asleep, that's one red flag. So that's something we can see. They're falling asleep in school, right? Mm-hmm. Teachers might report, yeah, you know, they went over to the beanbag and slept for two hours today. Right. Well, now we're talking about missed learning opportunities. Now the poor sleep is actually impacting not just on a a chemical level inside the brain, the ability to gain new skills and learn and, and, you know, attend, but now we're just plain old missing out on opportunities for learning, whether they're falling asleep in in class or or during session. The other thing is parents falling asleep or napping during sessions, reporting that a child won't fall asleep at night. Yeah. You know, bedtime is really hard. They're just full of shenanigans. You know, they just won't fall asleep. Ha ha. That's a huge red flag. If a child's not falling asleep at bedtime, that's a huge indicator that there's probably some other adaptive systems that the families are trying to put in place to get the child to sleep that then result in poor sleep overnight because now we're in unsustainable habits to help them fall asleep. 
We'll be right back after word from our sponsor. Most of us spend more time at work than anywhere else doing anything else. So why not spend that time in a job you love? Introducing Triad's Jobs Marketplace, the only job site dedicated specifically to behavioral and mental health professionals. Featuring more than 1,000 open jobs from dozens of behavioral and mental health employers and searchable by location, professional field, employment type, specialization, and more. Jobs Marketplace helps you find your next career opportunity. Full-time, part-time, or gig time, make the most of your time. To access Jobs Marketplace, register for your free professional account at hellotriad.com slash bht. That's hellotriad.com slash bht. And then click to Jobs Marketplace. If you're already a member of the Triad community, visit app.hellotriad.com slash jobs. That's app.hellotriad.com slash jobs. Visit us today and take your next career step tomorrow. Really good. You know, I know that with each family, the sleep challenge are going to be unique and also the plans you put together. I know you individualize plans to meet the specific needs of each child, but in general, what are some of the strategies that you found successful to improve the sleep of these children? Yeah. So it's interesting because they sound so simple, but they're so hard. (laughs) Yes. They <laughs> so are. one thing is actually looking at the sleep schedule and making sure the child's being offered bedtime at the right time for their okay. age and for their daytime sleep. So if we have a seven-year-old who's napping, they're not going to go to bed at 7.30 or eight o'clock. So having reasonable expectations for the child's sleep. So, you know, the seven-year-old, we might need to remove the nap, but then what time is bedtime? Very good. What time would bedtime be for a seven-year-old if they are no longer napping, which they shouldn't be necessarily, yes. and waking up at what time? So we start with morning wake up and say, hey, are they waking up at the same time every morning? Because if they're not waking up at the same time every morning, they're not going to be going to bed at the same time every night. So those waking up and bedtime routines, those function best when they're pretty yes. specific. And also some of the yes. daytime habits yes. are some really important ways that you can intervene. Absolutely. And again, this falls really into the do no harm category, as long as the child doesn't have a sleep disorder or needs to sleep during the day because of some sort of medications. These are questions Mm -hmm. we need to ask, things like that. But in general, when we have wishy-washy morning wake up times, the perception of the family is that they never know when bedtime is, but no one's looking at morning wake up. And so then we go in and easily say, hey, what time does the child need to be up on average every day? Okay, seven o'clock, great. Let's just make sure they're awake by seven o'clock every day. This is going to help bedtime be so much easier. You are going to find the child is actually tired at the bedtime we've decided on based on their age and how long they need to be awake and things like that. So in addition to some of those routines and some rituals around bedtime itself, Mm -hmm. are there any ways that you order the activities around bedtime to kind of help facilitate, hey, we're starting to move towards sleep? How do you do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I call it scaffolding. But you know, when we think about it, a a typical bedtime routine, even for ourselves, how many of us turn off the TV and go to sleep Mm. with nothing in between? (laughs) So when we're looking at children in general, and and we can talk about this in the scope of the autism population where they become a little bit more dependent on, let's say, screens or more dependent on their habits and things like that. If we're going from screen time to bedtime, Mm -hmm. we are actually going from highly preferred to potentially highly aversive. So how is that transition going to go for you? It's not going to go well in anyone's (laughs) No, it's not. It's not. And look, we grew up like that. Time for bed. We grew up like that. The switch. The seventies and the eighties, man. It was like go to bed, TV off, go to sleep. That was it. There was no like books. There was no story time. It was just go to bed. And so, bedtime naturally is this potentially aversive time for many children. It's a time of predictable separation from caregivers. It's a time of solitude. It's a time of darkness. It's a time of quiet. And all of these things are potentially aversive to kids on the autism spectrum, right? So if we're going right from highly preferred to that, oh, forget about it. That's so (laughs) good. You know, I'd like to stop you right there. Yeah. We don't oftentimes think of sleep for children. 
mm. as they're going to be separate in a dark area and it's aversive. We, we kind of don't give that credit. We just think, you know, like you said, back in the day, you know, turn the TV off, go to sleep or, <laughs> you know, turn the light off and go to sleep. Bam, it's just supposed to happen. Yep. And yet those are the things that the child is going to be experiencing in just a few minutes mm. as they kind of, you know, hearken towards sleep, ideally. Yep. But there are ways that we can kind of help maybe order that or kind of usher them into Absolutely. this more preferred state that's maybe a little bit more acceptable as they try Absolutely. to go to sleep. Yeah. So I use a hierarchy for that. So I like to sit down with families and put a list of activities that the child enjoys. Maybe not highly preferred because most kids, a lot of parents are going to say, well, all they like is the iPad. That's the only thing they enjoy. Oh, we know that's not true. Let's dig a little bit deeper. So we look at things that are, let's say, incompatible with running around because running around isn't going to help with sleep and not screen-based because screen time steals melatonin. The blue light coming off the screens stops melatonin production. So this is the takeaway for adults too. Like we should not be on our screens in bed because when we are looking at our iPads or our Kindles or tablets or phones, our brain is registering that it's still daytime and we're not producing any melatonin (laughs) because it's daytime. So screen time out. So how do we transition from, let's say a screen dependent child, which many of the clients on our autism spectrum are screen dependent, right? For all kinds of things, even even just for communication, right? We have a lot of clients Mm -hmm. who are screen dependent just for their communication. That's where their communication systems live. So how do we go from that to bedtime? So hierarchy. So we go, let's say from highest preferred is let's say the tablet or, or something like that. We can go from tablet to TV. Mm. TV is less of a problem than a tablet because a tablet's going to be up close. It's going to be six to 12 inches from your face. Whereas the TV is going to be maybe mounted on the wall, the child sitting on the floor or the, the couch or something like that. And it's going to be the blue light that's coming off the screen is going to be more diffused. So maybe we go from tablet to TV. Gotcha. And then maybe we go from TV to whatever they like, puzzles, put-ins, cars, building, Legos, even some kinetic sand, Play-Doh, something sensory that's exciting, that's maybe not as accessible throughout the day. Maybe parents yeah. don't like bringing out the Play-Doh because it's a mess. <laughs> but maybe that's going to help transition from yeah. a screen experience to something else. And then we can go, let's say, from a sensory strategy to maybe a bath, something that's also preferred bath or shower water is often a highly preferred activity. Give them 30 minutes in the shower, 30 minutes in the bath. Okay. Well, in California, we have a drought. All right. So maybe just in the short term, we do the water thing, but water is very relaxing. You can put some Epsom salts in, in the bath to further help with that relaxation, something like that. And then we can go to some quiet play in the room or pajamas and maybe some more experiences in the bed. And so now we really have this transition. We have a full hour of just transition going from highest preferred to that least preferred or aversive time. And we're easing the brain and the body into that. I really like that easing piece. I know that one of the things you do, you try and focus on sustainability of sleep habits versus just these are the good ones and these are the bad ones. You're trying to find something <laughs> yep. that you have kind of, you use the word scaffold, that it's, it's kind of interconnected, isn't it? Mm. Leading up to a more relaxed and sleep ready state mm. that is connected with a relationship that is kind of moving in a very nice and calming way mm. to a sleep ready state. I really like that. <laughs> Yeah, it's super helpful. I mean, families sometimes just find that by changing their bedtime routine, mm-hmm. suddenly they have fewer yeah. you know, behaviors at bedtime, less bedtime resistance. I mean, just between the bedtime routine and the timing of lights out, those yeah. are two huge factors that they're hard. They're hard at the beginning to make those changes for the first couple of nights. It's, it's yeah. difficult to put your brain there and you know change right. things and, and your mindset and everything. But they really pack the biggest punch. They really That's so do. good. That's mm-hmm. so good. You had talked earlier about how because of the higher cortisol and lower melatonin and kind of a highly alert kind of awake mm-hmm. state and the difficulty around that. Is is melatonin sometimes prescribed or, or used in a helpful, beneficial way for some people with so, ASD? Oh, that's you just hit the hot button topic, didn't you? <laughs> you went mm-hmm. straight in for the hot button. That's because I've got you on the show and I know you're gonna answer it for me. <laughs> it is a hot topic. So I'll say this. 
some kids on the autism spectrum are low producers Mm -hmm. of melatonin or inconsistent producers. Like if they have that slow metabolism of melatonin and it's not going to spike for them, Mm -hmm. melatonin can be helpful. Melatonin in Western cultures in the United States, I think is overused as a sleep aid when that's not really the function of melatonin. It's really a circadian rhythm balancer. So in its roots, melatonin is really designed for circadian rhythm adjustment like jet lag. So if you have jet lag, if you're traveling east and you need to be asleep by nine, but your body thinks it's four in the afternoon, you're going to want to take a melatonin to help regulate your body to the local time zone or something like that. Time changes. That's what it's used for. Other than that, in the rest of the world, besides the United States, Really, melatonin is only prescribed to humans over 50, because over the age of 50, we do slow in our production of melatonin. What I think happens sometimes is that melatonin is this easy button, but what the research is showing is that it's really this huge placebo effect, that it's not really the melatonin, it's the perception around, here's this routine that's now signaling our own melatonin. So that's a couple of research studies have come out with this major placebo effect, not to underestimate the placebo mm-hmm. effect because this placebo effect is the most impactful, robust yes. effect in science. That's why we have placebo controlled studies, Correct. right? Yeah. They're very substantial. So the answer is some humans probably need it. I think if you describe it like this, I think the hope lies in you know, it's not a necessary thing. And if it's appropriate, and you, you can talk with your doc about that kind of thing. Yeah. But what I what I hear the hope being in is the word you just used a moment ago, it's in the routines mm. that we can put into place and that you create in yeah. a very individualized way to meet those specific right. needs. And what I what I hear you looking to do is to create probably a longer term routine that focuses on the sustainability Correct. of sleep habits that offers Correct. families and of the clinicians that you're training yeah. kind of a broader, more longer view perspective of sleep that results in more sustainable sleep over time. So I think yeah. that's probably the longer term view of being pretty successful around that. Yeah. And, you know, with, with in regards to melatonin, you know, people don't like the idea of being on something the rest of their lives. And sure. the truth is with melatonin, you do need more and more and more over time because the body does regulate to it. So now we have, you know, kids who are in 10 milligrams, 15 milligrams. I mean, that's a lot of melatonin when if we can get away from those things and just, you know, put something in place that is going to be more sustainable and more, I don't, I don't want to use the word natural, but you know, a little, just, just more sustainable really. And more. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, ingrained, I guess, just in your daily routines, it's going to be easier over time than always having to wonder, oh, you know, oh, maybe they didn't get their melatonin yeah. or, oh, we don't have melatonin. Yeah. It's, 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 it's nice not to have a dependency upon something. It's nice to have yeah. access to the things that we can control and good habits lead usually to good things happening. And you're talking about these individualized plans and the sustainability around sleep. So sleep improves with the kids you're working with. And yeah. tell me what you're noticing in their behaviors, in the reports you're hearing coming back from, hey, my kid is getting some good sleep. And also in the families, Yep. what yeah. are you hearing back so, in terms of I mean, of the families help? are obviously happier, more engaged. They, they feel right. better. They're more awake. Yeah. Their health improves. I mean, some of these families, you know, especially when we're looking at the autism population, they've been suffering with poor sleep for years. I mean, I, I, my most extreme situation was a 16 year old young woman who hadn't slept since she was four years old and the mother was, didn't realize the connection, but she was experiencing diabetes and she had had two heart attacks by the time her daughter was 16. And once we got sleep fixed and figured out, and, and it was so surprising because it wasn't a hard program. It wasn't, it wasn't anything huge that we put into place. But it was just, I mean, the supervisor reported back to me, they just said like, they they can't believe how much more available the young woman was to learning, how she wasn't throwing her tablet at staff anymore, how she was being compliant with instructions. And that's not to say that compliance is necessarily what we wanted. But those are are such measurable things you're saying. Those are tangible Measurable things that changes someone's life, let alone yes. forgetting that without sleep, we get sick. Yes. 
we are more susceptible to things. Our, our immune systems emotionally and, and, and yes. biologically are, are worn down. Yes. And we are highly susceptible relationally and, and, and just physically mm. to becoming more and more sick, aren't we? Mm. Oh, a hundred percent. Absolutely. I think, you know, sleep is at the top of the pyramid when it comes to health and wellness. You know, you can eat all the kale you want. I mean, you could be all the, you know, vitamins and supplements, but if you're not sleeping, your body is not digesting that stuff. It's yeah. not using those nutrients and you're not going to be craving that kind of thing. You're going to be craving donuts. You bet. You bet. <laughs> so that's where all the bad stuff comes in. Well, that's really encouraging. This work that you're doing and the sustainability you're helping folks create does work. I, I know you also take this work outside of your clinic with patients and families. I know you also do professional trainings and yes. help your colleagues through yes. the trainings and consultations. You do some intensive staff trainings and yep. supervision. Talk to us a little bit about how you're helping the colleagues and those in the mental health field dealing with yes. these sleep challenges. Yeah. I mean, I'm only one person, right? So if I teach other people to do what I do, then I've just exponentially impacted the autism population. Yeah. And so that's really my philosophy in going out and teaching other people about sleep and, and offering continuing education opportunities and in-house trainings for you know ABA companies or really any company who wants to improve productivity. But really, if I can teach other BCBAs, other people working in the ABA field to do this same sort of analysis and pulling apart of what's really going on with sleep, yes. I can improve their skills then I don't have to work with that client. Then that one person oversees 20 clients. And so oh. now 20 kids have benefited from one person's education. Right. So I really only see myself as the deliverer <laughs> of the information, yeah. but really, you know, the more people I can expose to these strategies and philosophies of, you know, fix the sleep and you're really fixing a huge part of the picture and improving, you know, skill acquisition and improving people's experience of ABA and ABA therapy, and just really improving the lives of people impacted by autism. I mean, I think that's just like the cherry on top, right? I mean, but yeah, I mean, I always say I'm just one person. Yeah. I mean, my voice, my voice only goes to the people who hear it. So I like it. if those people can pass on those messages, that's really the, the exponential growth that really that excites good. Me. Yeah, really good. Well, this is some information that I think clinicians can not just so benefit for their own practice and, and their own, you know, areas of competence, but I agree with you. It's kind of like that Claire all commercial. She told one friend and she told one friend and so on and so on and so on, you know, it just kind of ex exponentially grows. And I think yeah. that's tremendous. Yeah. I would love for those families and parents going through some challenges with their child and sleep challenges that they have. And also those clinicians and professionals listening to our show today to be able to have access to you, Emily. Mm -hmm. Give us some information about how they can contact you and uh, how they can find out more about how they can re some, receive some help from you. Yeah. Best place is my website. It's very easy. Readysetsleep.com. Like uh, Readysetsleep.com. If you go to the services tab, you can see all the different services that are available to teams, to okay. ABA companies, to professional institutions. And then there are also services available for families directly. Yeah. Scroll all the way to the bottom. I, I always prefer families to get the service through their ABA companies, okay. you know, because it's, it's free with their services, mm. right? Like it's accessing healthy sleep. Shouldn't be hard. That's right. It shouldn't be hard and it shouldn't be cost prohibitive. So if we can embed it into our ABA language and it be rolled into that $15 copay that they're paying right. for their ABA services. Wow. Right. Like for me, that's, that's it. I mean, it shouldn't be hard to access sleep. It shouldn't be hard to access good sleep, but yeah, ready, set, sleep.com. I'm also on Instagram. I do some funny, silly videos and I'm 47 and I do Instagram and it's really weird and cringy, but I do it anyway. It's, it's fun. fun and playful. Good for you. Oh yeah. And that's just ready, set, sleep as well. Got it. Good. We're going to have that up on our site as I'll say in just a few minutes, but, uh, Emily, it's been great to be with you today. It's been great to learn about how uh, the sleep challenges are unique to this population and their families and how life-changing the work you're doing really is for these folks and how life can be so, so very different and how clinicians can now be equipped mm. to come in and be of service and a benefit mm. to those coming with this challenge that we're talking about today all around these sleep problems that are just so common. So thank you so much for being with thank us. Thank you. No, thank you for having me. It was an absolute pleasure. <laughs> Yeah, it's been a lot of pleasure. Fun. It has. I agree with you.
Well, I also want to thank you, our listeners, for joining Emil and me today. Regarding our episode today, I want to remind you that it and its resources and all of our other podcasts can be found on our webpage at triadhq.com slash BHT. So check out our webpage, triadhq.com slash BHT, and explore our archive of podcasts and resource materials. Thanks again for being with us on the show, and we'll look forward to having you back with us next time on Behavioral Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community, and if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tribe Network, all rights reserved.